Ashley stood frozen in the centre of the studio. Brad Messiter led a baying chorus of true or not, true or not. Their voices fused and swelled in his head. His mouth opened and closed, but his eyes followed the video cassettes that Cosima was brandishing above her head, never leaving them for a second. I have printouts of your diary, too, Mr. Barson Garland. Cosima's free hand dipped into her briefcase and brought out sheaves of paper. What extraordinary reading they make. Ashley screeched in rage and made a half lunge towards her. At the last minute, he veered away from her and ran from the studio, dropping his microphone on the floor. Blindly, he butted his way past security officers, too startled and confused to know what to do. He tore down the corridors and into reception, barely noticing the cluster of BBC employees staring at the screen set into the wall. He pushed his way out of the glass doors and hurtled madly through the horseshoe forecourt and out onto Wood Lane. He heard voices raised behind him, but he charged through the security gate and into the street. Cabs were lined up on the rank, and he hurled himself at the first, scrabbling at the door. "'All right, mate, all right, calm down!' The driver released his central locking switch, and Ashley threw himself into the seat. "'St. James's! I know you. You're that uh, Barson Garland bloke!' "'Never mind!' Ashley's breath came in huge, gulping sobs. "'Duke Street, as fast as you can!' Right out. Shame that bill of yours was never passed. It's about time those perverts were brought to book. Got kids myself. Ashley felt in his pocket and almost wept with relief when his fingers closed around his leather Smythson key wallet. He had left the keys in his dressing room the previous week and had been forced to return to Television Centre at midnight to retrieve them. He had cursed himself at the time, but had that not happened, he would never have decided to keep them in his pocket today. He looked out of the back window of the cab and saw a crowd streaming from the studio audience door at the side of the building. "'Had that Gary Glitter in here once?' said the cabbie. As Ashley had feared, a small crowd had already gathered in Mason's yard. A handheld TV light focused on his front door and was turned towards the cab as it swung into the alley from Duke Street. "'Struth, you got a few fans, then,' said the cabbie, shielding his eyes. "'Going to make you party leisure, are they?' Ashley pushed a twenty-pound note through the glass and opened the cab door, his keys ready. Keep the change. Very generous, Governor. You got my vote. Mr. Barson Garland! Mr. Barson Garland! I have no comment, no comment, no comment, no comment at all. He pushed his way through the press of people, head down, key outstretched towards the door. Is there any truth in these allegations? No comment, I tell you. I have absolutely no comment. He slammed the door on them and bolted it. As soon as he was alone... The tears began to flow. The telephone upstairs in his study was ringing. He wrenched it from its socket and stood on the carpet, tears flowing down his cheeks. All around him were displayed the symbols of his success. The Romney portrait of a Sir William Barson that he had allowed people to believe was his ancestor stared down at him, hand on hip. His first editions of Gibbon, Carlyle and Burke gleamed on the shelves, and on the desk stood his computer. It was a lie, all a lie. They had trapped him. For some evil, terrible reason, they had trapped him into revealing himself. Video cameras in his study. It was inconceivable. Who would do such a thing? Inconceivable. Yet they must have known. They could not have guessed that it was his practice to... He woke his computer and input the first password. The diary files were also password protected. Security within security. No one could have penetrated them. He double-clicked the most recent entry made yesterday when the world was still at his feet. The system demanded a second password, which he gave. The diary pages loaded themselves, and he looked at them. Sad news about poor old Rufus Cade. By all accounts, a drug hit, as these things are termed. I suppose it was inevitable. From schoolboy on, it was apparent that dear Rufus was destined for a life of dependency and decline. What Americans would call an addictive, compulsive personality, or some such hogwash. I have not seen him since he called upon me some five years ago with an embarrassing request for money to invest in a footling scheme to start up a model agency. I shall attend his funeral, I think, and pray for the salvation of his soul. Grace will not be denied him. A gratifying review of the first programme in the Telegraph this morning. It seems I am a natural performer combining ease of manner with a steely refusal to be diverted from the hard moral questions. Look out, David Starkey.'